Hi everyone, this is Wendy Mies coming to you with the second episode of the podcast for the Left Pocket Project, where I bring you the history of leftists of color one swipe at a time. In today's episode, I speak with writers Zoe Samutzi and Devon Springer about the unfolding political situation in Zimbabwe and the place of Africa as a whole in contemporary leftist discourse, particularly in the West. To give you a little background on today's guest, Zoe Samutzi is a Zimbabwean American writer and member of the 2017 2018 Public Imagination Cohort at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts Fellows Program. Zoe is also a member of the Black Aesthetic, an Oakland based collective and film series exploring the multitudes and diversities of Black artistic production and literary visual culture. Zoe's work has appeared in a variety of publications, including The New Inquiry, Warscapes, Truth Out, Roar Magazine, Teen Vogue, Black Girl Dangerous, Bitch Media, and Verso, among others. You can find Zoe on Twitter at ZTSamutzi. I am also joined by Devin Springer, known as Half Atlanta on Twitter. Devin is a writer, artist, and organizer who focuses on African and African diaspora studies, art history, and the left. Devin's book of poetry and art, Grayish Black, is available on Amazon. Devin's writing has been featured in several platforms, including Afropunk, Truth Out, Mondo Weiss, Think Progress, Philadelphia Printworks, The Vocal, and Off the Record, among others. While Devin's artwork has appeared in several galleries, including Murmur, Zuckerman, and Wellesley. Devin, Zoe, and I recorded our discussion last week, and since then, there have been a few changes in Zimbabwe, most notably incoming President Emerson Mnangagwa's appointment of a new cabinet including members of the military in high-ranking positions, affirming some of the concerns Zoe goes on to express in the podcast regarding whether or not the nation will go in a different direction with Mugabe out of office, with ZANU-PF, Zimbabwe's ruling party, still in power. In addition to our discussion on Zimbabwe, we talk about the place of African politics and current events in Western media, particularly the Western left and ways to avoid reinforcing the same problems we see in mainstream media representations of Africa on our side. Today I'm here with Zoe Zamutsi and Devon Springer. Uh, We're going to be talking a bit about what's going on in Africa in the present, more specifically Zimbabwe, as well as other parts, um, if it comes up. And also the way that we as leftists um, can think about Africa as a continent, as a political space, where where our discussions of Africa go, because as both authors argue, they're a bit lacking. Um, So thank you both for being here with me. I really appreciate it. And I hope you're having a great weekend thus far. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for um, inviting us and having us on. So I wanted to start, actually, this is just a bit of an open discussion, but if you could talk a bit about what's going on in Zimbabwe, um, we've seen a bit in the news, everything's sort of frantic and hurried that uh, that Mugabe, who's the president of Zimbabwe, has been deposed by the military. Every day a new story comes out, and I think the layers of stories make things a bit muddled and confusing. So if you could just give us an overview really quickly of um, your understanding of what's going on in Zimbabwe. And also, if you have any contacts with people there still, what has been their perspective on the ongoing um, unfolding political situation there? Yeah. So from the way that I understand it, um, you know, Robert Mugabe was president of Zimbabwe from independence. So from 1980 until a few days ago. And um, he, his, his, Tenure in office has been marked by a lot of political coercion, by violence, by election rigging. And, you know, it was really interesting when the coup, the not coup coup was beginning to unfold and people were saying, well, we can't use the military. You have to use electoral means. You have to use the ballot. And it's like, well, what are, what is a democratic election and what is an attempt to remove a person from office when he loses elections and refuses to abdicate his position? But Mm -hmm. basically... The, the non-coup, the guardian coup, I guess, came about when he was he has been maneuvering over the past couple of years um, to ensure that his wife assumes office um, after he leaves. So in 2000, and, I think 2014, he removed Joyce Mujuru, uh, one of his vice presidents, who was seen as 
someone who would potentially succeed him. Um, he removed her from her post as vice president. And recently, um, he removed Emerson Nangagua, who was the vice president, um, another one of his vice presidents, and has been a part of the post-independence government from the beginning. He was minister of home affairs. He was in the military. He was part of, um, I think he was the minister of justice recently until the cabinet reshuffle. Mm -hmm. Um, But... You know, Emerson Nangagua, having been a general during the Liberation War, was supported by the military. And in an attempt to clear him out of the way to make um, Grace Mugabe the deputy vice president, which would mean that in the event that President Mugabe died in office, she would become president but not have to be elected into office. Um, The military, I think they overplayed their hand in under estimating how much people really resisted her as a leader. Mm-hmm. And so the military, in opposition to her and in support of Emerson, Emerson Nangagua, came in to be like, no, we can't have these undemocratic means of leadership, so we're going to do this thing and we're going to... And it was very clever. They positioned themselves not as trying to overthrow the government or to overthrow the state, but as trying to protect the Constitution which was incredibly clever of them because it ensured that they did not alienate the international community through this forced transition of power. So what has actually happened in my understanding is that the ruling party has actually been strengthened because it looks as though they are clearing house in a way and removing these undemocratic elements from the party when actually they're just removing a single person in order to put forth the person that they would actually have preferred to have been the leader mm-hmm. or preferred to be the leader in the future. And so what seems like this this nationwide democratic ish, uh, attempt was actually the projection of internal party politics within ZANU-PF projected onto the entire national political arena. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what has also come out of this is the opposition you know, the movement for democratic change um, and also Joyce Majuru's party, they kind of look ineffectual because they, it's, it almost feels as though they're waiting for an invitation um, into this Nangagwa-led government as opposed to, you know, making their statement and their claim as opposition and kind of participating in this robust democracy. Mm-hmm. So I don't trust Emerson Nangagwa because he was a part of the Gukurahundi, which was a lot of, which was um, ethnic violence in the early 1980s, shortly after independence, which led to the consolidation of ZAPU, which was the Independence Party, the Liberation Party, the other one at the time, the consolidation of that party into ZANU to become ZANU-PF. And he has been a part of the Mugabe government for a very long time. He has been complicit in a lot of the violence and a lot of the corruption for a long time. And so I have my own skepticism about his, um, about his leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, But it seems as though folks at home are incredibly hopeful. It seems as though there are people who are able to participate in politics um, now because they're no longer afraid of repression from President Mugabe, former President Mugabe. So, um, I'm I'm incredibly skeptical. I think a lot of other people are also very skeptical, but I think people are also hopeful and looking for new ways of participating in the state, for new ways of making Zimbabwe more democratic. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's a lot of mixed feelings about what's going on right now, from my understanding. So speaking a bit of these mixed feelings, um, you wrote a piece in 2016 entitled Diaspora Mugabe Supporters and the Limits of a Neo-Colonial Pan-Africanism. You wrote that for OK Africa. And one of the things you noted, and I think this is where Devin's piece really fits in, which we can talk about in a bit, you noted here that um, with regard to discussions of what's going on in Africa, um, and in particular within Zimbabwe on the left in the U.S. and elsewhere, you quote here say that there's little consideration given to the idea that once revolutionary leadership may devolve into power-hungry, self-serving, and often nepotistic um, capitalist leadership. 
And so what's interesting, um, thinking about that, and then again, some of the things that Devin can, Devin, you can talk about in a minute, is that what I've seen on the left, at least on in the Twitter sphere and social media and in certain articles, there seems to be this strange approach to what's going on in Zimbabwe right now. So on the one hand, mm-hmm. you have people who are saying, no, he's a revolutionary, as you note here in your piece, Zoe, um, he's a revolutionary and we have to support him no matter what. On the other hand, there's a bit that's saying this is a U.S. backed coup. This is all the work of the U.S. or Britain, um, that the vice president who currently holds power is now trying to placate white farmers. I mean, I'm getting so many mis- mixed messages and a lot of it seems to be rooted in a large lack of familiarity with what's going on. Um, politically within sub-Saharan Africa or Africa as a whole. So I wonder if, if both of you could kind of contribute here to this. What What is going on, first of all, in terms of the U.S. or European left even? How are they approaching it? Is it just completely off base? Uh, or should we should we dig a bit deeper and try to figure out maybe that there's some nuance to be had here? What do you all think about that? Um, well, I mean, I think as far as response from the um the US and the UK so just really the western left in general has just been very tone deaf and off base because it just shows a clear lack of understanding of not only Zimbabwean politics but of the entire region um within Africa as well so i think that as zoe said earlier people don't understand that this is that um Mangwagwa is in the same party that Mugabe was. Mm-hmm. So this isn't, this is not, you know, no one is viewing this as a transfer to some new party or some new revolutionary exciting moment. This is still a power grab to keep the same party in power. And it it's done under the illusion of some huge change, when in reality, his nickname is the crocodile. And he's responsible for massacres of millions of people, or I'm sorry, thousands of people and has a terrible track record as well as Mugabe. Mm-hmm. So I think that this is a this is an internal conflict that the Western left with this very Western centric view is projecting a lot more onto it. They're projecting this kind of a Western backed narrative when in reality that doesn't make sense for it to be a Western backed coup, non coup, whatever you want to call it, when the same exact um the same people are being served either way right mm-hmm. so before and after it's still the same interests being protected and served through the same party and what are those interests if both of you can speak to this but is there a particular economic interest that's being served or something a bit deeper than that um because i've seen even posts about uh trump's recent or attempt to uh take back the laws governing over the hunting of particular protected animals and semi-extinct uh, groups like elephants. Um, some were saying that this is a this is a, U, a move by the U.S. to sort of <laughs> allow for that type of hunting. And I said, I don't think it's quite that simple. Um, so what are some of the interests in particular that you all are talking about? Is there a particular resource within Zimbabwe or several um, that certain groups are going after even within the country? Or is it a bit, if, does it go even beyond that? What are they trying to protect in the process? So the interesting thing about the military and calling this coup um, a Western-backed coup is that back in 2008, when Mugabe was going to lose the election to Morgan Shangirai, who's the leader of one of the MDC opposition parties, Morgan Shangirai looked like he was going to win, and the military generals also threatened a coup. Um, And Morgan Shangirai was the political figure who would have been most favorable to the West. And so it seems a little bit confusing for this to be a Western-backed coup and then also for that to be a Western-backed coup when those political interests were kind of at odds with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as also participants, I think we're also forgetting the really big role that China plays in Zimbabwean politics. Um, particularly in Zimbabwean economic um, politics. I think they're one of the big, they're perhaps the biggest, if maybe second to South Africa, but one of the biggest trading partners of the Zimbabwean government. Um, and I'm not necessarily going to say that China was part of the coup because I don't, ne- I don't think that Mugabe was presenting any real obstacles to Chinese investment. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I think that they would be generally in favor of any um, of any leader that would make their ability to do business in the country easier, which I think that Morgan Shangirai would. I'm sorry, that Emerson Nangagwa would. Um, I think in his inauguration speech, he also said he was making comments about welcoming foreign investment and welcoming economic participation with Zimbabwe, um, which matches some of the positive rhetoric around, you know, trade and improved economic relationships with the UK and with the European Union, um, which follow kind of, uh, you know, vague conversations of the lifting of sanctions and the normalization of relationships with Zimbabwe again. Mm -hmm. So Emerson, more than he is an ideologue, is a businessman. Mm -hmm. And I think he's going to do what, he feels is necessary to, and what is necessary because, you know, Zimbabwe is facing a cash crisis. They're presently using the American dollar and they're having to buy um, U.S. dollars. They introduced this, this, this currency called the bond note, which is equivalent somehow to the U.S. dollar. Um, so they do need foreign investment and they do need to have capital injected into the economy, but kind of at what cost? And Nangagwa, you know, in his, in his inauguration speech was like, we're not going to roll back any of the gains made by the revolution, by the liberation struggle. Um, and also we need to make jobs and we also need to. So it's going to be interesting to see how he does pay lip service to the continuation of these revolutionary, quote unquote, revolutionary values that are supposedly upheld by the ruling party, while also seeming like he's posturing the country to participate in this kind of like neoliberal economic market in the way that much of the rest of the continent does. So it's going to be interesting to see how, um, how, how he negotiates deals with the West, how he negotiates deals with China, and how he is actually able to ensure the state maintains its kind of economic and polit political sovereignty in those relationships. Right. And and it's important to note, too, um, that Zimbabwe hasn't been the, I guess I don't know the word for it, the 100% independent um, of foreign investment, or I guess foreign mining land that Mugabe tried to paint it as. I mean, their main, the main resources in Zimbabwe would be like gold, um, diamonds in the West, coal, chromium, copper, these type of things. And there has been involvement um, with German mining companies, Chinese mining companies, um, even other African mining companies from Mozambique and other countries have had involvement in the land for the past few years now. So I think that when, when there was announced, when, when Emerson announced that they were going to be opening up to foreign investors, there was a lot of grumbling, but it has actually already been happening. And there's been a multi-currency system in Zimbabwe for, I don't know, Zoe, at least a decade now, if I'm not mistaken, right? No, there is no longer one. So there was one for a short period of time for a couple of years, and then they moved to the U.S. dollar. Oh, okay, okay. So, so a lot of the quote-unquote changes he stated are actually things that he stated would be made are things that are already taking place in small forms that he would just make larger and greater and more significant. Mm -hmm. so I think it's important to note that as well. And has there been, I mean, again, this is for both of you, um, particularly thinking, Devin, of your piece in which you write that, quote unquote, the Western left has an Africa problem, right? You say here mm -hmm. that we see the Western left prominently supporting the movement, self-determination struggles, anti-interventionisms, and basic humanity of several communities in various parts of the world. And these communities certainly deserve much more support than they are currently receiving. But you ask then, however, when will there be room to support African struggles equally on this roster? And I think this is where your and Zoe's piece really dovetail because she's also asking a question about, um, you know, where where's the place of African struggles, the, the voices of Africans themselves um, in our discussions of the left or leftist mm -hmm. movements worldwide. And I, I wonder in this case in particular with regard to Zimbabwe, where, do, where does the Western left even fit? Because on the one hand, you have some people, um, what we've seen in the news, celebrating the end of Mugabe, um, celebrating 
an incoming or maybe not incoming, but I guess a, a president who's of a of the same party, but of a slightly different um, sentiment on trade and the like. But it's a bit confusing of, first of all, whether the Western left has any place in this struggle at all, right? I mean, can it, it's a it's a strange place to be in because on the one hand, you want to be able to express solidarity, but at the same time, the question is to whom, right? And how? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm curious about both of your thoughts about this and in particular uh, with regard to so many mixed messages coming out of the continent itself and out of Zimbabwe itself in particular. What are your thoughts on this? Um, so, I mean, I think that Whenever you ask the question of where does the Western left um, have room, my answer always wants, I always want to say like <laughs> nowhere in their own homes <laughs> worrying about their own empire. Right. <laughs> but, but no, so I think the first, um, the first optic to look at is why, why after just many, many, many events this year happening on the, the continent of Africa, is this event in Zimbabwe suddenly such a big deal for the Western left? Mm-hmm. Um, there's been huge, major Western-backed corruption scandals in the Congo, Western-backed arms deals happening in South Sudan and Sudan, um, you know, just dozens and dozens of things that have taken place. So why did this now become what they decided to pay attention to? The second optic I look at is who are they speaking over? So who are these American and UK and French and all these extremely Western leftists speaking over? And what I saw on social media as thousands upon thousands of Zimbabweans are cheering for this uh, exchange of leaders, um, I saw them speaking over those Zimbabweans, t- telling, you know, calling Zimbabweans imperialist garbage or saying you fell for propaganda. And it's really at the root of it an anti-Black assumption that Zimbabweans don't understand their own politics and aren't skeptical of their own politics and their own countries that are taking place and critical of those things. Um, so to me, what I think the Western left role to, role is, if you're not a scholar, or at least, you know, if you're not someone who's well studied in African events, is to one, not pretend like you care, not pretend like you are. Mm-hmm. And then two, to listen to actual Zimbabweans, and to educate yourself through listening to them. Because that was the the one thing that got me was a lot of people who were silent about any politics on the African continent at all suddenly became experts and then so much of experts that they were able to talk over and trying to erase and silence actual Zimbabweans. Mm-hmm. And we see this with regard to, I mean, I guess any, any sort of struggles that are going on throughout the non, what we would consider non-Western countries, right? Um, so on the one hand, we see a lot about hands off Syria, hands off Venezuela, hands off fill in the blank uh, country that's not in the US or Europe. But at the same time, it begs the question of, again, which voices to listen to. And I think that's where the confusion gets in or comes in, right? Um, Because we could argue, to play devil's advocate for a minute, uh, we could say, well, there are Syrians, for example, who are calling for intervention. Um, There are Venezuelans who are calling for intervention. So the question becomes, when do we uh, or where do we draw the line? Um, And how do I think some people who are maybe less educated on uh, these issues if they're interested in learning more, I think it's a bit confusing as to where where they can do that um, and get a real sense of whatever the left or leftists, plural, think in those places. Any thoughts on that for either of you? I think what, pe- I think what people just need to do is, like, go read history and go read the history of the particular country in question. Have a look at the survey of what people of, of the different stances that people are holding and why they're holding those stances, and then make your own kind of value judgment for yourself. Again, not that your opinion really is of any consequence. Right. But when it comes to Zimbabwe, you know, I think that there's this tendency to force kind of left politics into this binary of either being anti-imperialist or pro-imperialist, and there's kind of no space for things to hold multitudes. You know. President Mugabe, or former President Mugabe, becomes this revolutionary leader because of some, these performances of hating white people in the United Nations and because of his land reform politics that is, was done not super well. Um, but, you know, there's no, no, there's no, like, real concern for what is happening materially to the people of Zimbabwe. Like, there's no concern for the fact that 
you know, people were spending, when there was, during the period of hyperinflation, people were spending billions of dollars on a loaf of bread. There was no concern for the fact that, you know, when he, when he prevented people from importing things from South Africa because he wanted to rejuvenate the, the, the domestic industrial sector that people were just unable to get a lot of things that they needed. They're missing the fact that there were surgeons and doctors who went on strike because they did not have the equipment necessary for them to do their job. Like there were surgeons who literally were not able to do particular kinds of surgery because the government refused to import anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, the, or the drugs they needed for anesthesia. So, and, and then there's also this thing of, like, in, interests may converge, but they converge for completely different reasons. That Zimbabwean people, after 40 years, have a reasonable reason to celebrate Mugabe being deposed, but that reason for celebration is completely different from the United States government or from the British government's desire to see him removed from office. Right. And I think the refusal to understand the really vast difference in political needs and political desires is a real, um, I mean, we, all, we, we keep saying, you know, it's, it's, it's impact and not intent. But I think when it comes to a lot of politics, I think intention is incredibly important as well. Mm -hmm. And so Zimbabweans being on the street and celebrating the removal of this man that has made life so difficult for so many people for such a long time, it's completely different from, you know, Theresa May talking about England being Zimbabwe's oldest friend <laughs> and looking forward to reinstating relationships. Like, those are two completely different right. ways of relating to the country, the, its economy, and its people, and to not see these things as being drastically different. I think, I mean, I hate the word nuance, but I think that you're doing your own left politic and anti-imperialist politic a really massive disservice to not understand the difference between the interest of empire and the interest of people. And that's not to say that there are not people in Zimbabwe who do share the interest of empire. Right. Like that's also not to, to pretend, but it right. is to say, if you would like open a book and have an understanding of like what people have been enduring for the past, however many years, you might have an understanding as to why they are not so happy about, or, or, and even why they might embrace a man that they know has been complicit in the ruling party's violence. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated than just these binaries that people are forcing political conditions and struggles into. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be curious to know from both of you, actually, I um, mean, thinking about becoming more educated, right? Especially for people who perhaps are not in the academy or that no one, you know, not everyone's doing a PhD. Not everyone is even um, involved deeply in leftist politics, right? Um, but what are some things that you would recommend for listeners or anyone just so happening to kind of try to learn more about the situation in Zimbabwe or, um, you know, Southern Africa as a whole, right? Who are some people or activists, um, even from past or present, that either of you would suggest that people take a look at more seriously and consider some of their principles. And I asked this because today, or actually yesterday, um, I saw a tweet that was by the East Bay DSA, which is um, Democratic Socialist of America, for anyone who's unaware. And they had suggested for part of their reading list, almost an entirely white and European and almost entirely male um, yeah, set of <laughs> book lists uh, for for being in in the like Southern California, right? Or in sorry, in, in East Bay and Oakland area, um, despite the fact that the Black Panthers saw their start there and many other um, leftist groups of color. So I'm wondering, how do we sort of break this cycle, right? And who are some of the people, African scholars, activists, leftists, et cetera, um, everyday people that perhaps people should learn more about and listen to, to sort of develop and deepen their understanding of what's going on there? So are you talking about Zimbabwe specifically? Both, actually. So Zimbabwe specifically, Southern Africa, um, Africa as a whole, because we can talk a bit more about that as well. But just anyone that you all are reading, people that you're paying attention to that you think others should perhaps consider more um, with more earn in more earnest, I should say. I mean, yeah. with Zimbabwe specifically, I would recommend Alois Mulambo, who has done two really good comprehensive um, volumes of Zimbabwean history kind of from pre-contact to about 2007, 2008. Um, there's this other man named Sabelo Ndlovu Gacheni, who's another historian who's really good. 
Um, there's also this man, he's white, his, though his name is Terrence Ranger, has, has done a lot of really good work about the way that the ruling party has perverted the history of liberation mm-hmm. um, in order to put forth ultimately an autocratic pol- politic in the name of preserving the history and the memory of the liberation and carrying it forward. Um, those are three people that I go back to quite a bit. And then also to learn about the cholera, there's a pal of mine um, who does a lot of really great work, and his name is um, Simukai Chibudu, Chigudu. Um, you know, there's a lot of Zimbabweans doing good work about Zimbabwe. I mean, I guess they're all unfortunately in the West, but um, Sabelo is in South Africa. Mm-hmm. And Devin, did you want to add to that? Um, so I actually just shared a really good reading list on my Facebook page with about 10 different articles. I'll be sure to include both the lists and the author's names in the show notes for other um, listeners to take a look at and hopefully read when they have the time. Um, but I really just wanted to think again a bit about, um, you know, where, not so much where does the Western left fit, right? Because to say Western left is a monolith um, is already a problematic statement, right? The Western left is as diverse as leftists um, from any other place, right? Um, But I think as a whole, first of all, it's important for us to be better informed. It's important for us to know the history as both of you all have relayed. It's also important for us to keep in track, keep on track with regard to what's going on with local activists, because I think as a whole, a lot of them are written out of the story, not considered as deeply um, and not to mention certain contemporary struggles. We tend to see, as you've argued, Zoe, in your piece, we tend to see Africa as a place of the past, right? Um, we tend to see African politics also as sort of static and isolated to a past. So in terms of more contemporary issues that are going on beyond Zimbabwe, um, one of them in particular thinking about what's happening in Libya right now, right? Um, it's it, just a side note. It's interesting to me in the ways or the ways that a lot of People in the West, even if they're well-intentioned, even if they themselves are of African descent, um, tend to sort of miss the boat sometimes. We tend to focus primarily on certain groups coming out of these countries or particular events as if they're brand new, when in actuality they've been going on for a while. So a perfect example is what's happening in Libya right now, um, following the war of intervention that involved many nations in Europe and the United States. Um, We've seen a focus on the slave trade all of a sudden in Libya. But if I recall correctly, there were several articles that came out earlier in the year, if not last year, about this process. Um, What is it in particular that you all think perhaps makes people miss these events or only pay attention to them when they, um, I don't know, become news on CNN? Like, what is it about Africa? Um, And I'm sorry to keep referring to it as a continent, but I'm thinking in particular just the ways that the Western press talks about it, right? I'm using that language. What is it about Africa, the continent, um, that perhaps makes people turn a blind eye or not fully understand or even take the time to learn? I mean, what's going on here? What can explain this? Um, So... And I, I think, like you said, the the slave trade, the, the trade of enslaved Africans in Libya has definitely been going on for a, a while now. Um, and there's actually been tons of articles written about it. People on Twitter have written threads about it over the past few years, but no one seemed to really care until it was on CNN. And there's this video proof of it. Now, prior to U.S. intervention, this this uh, trade of enslaved Africans was also still present and going on. Um, Prior to U.S. intervention, it was actually at one of its lowest points possible. Um, The reported findings of human trafficking and slave trade in Libya was just generally abysmal. And then after U.S. intervention and the country is essentially decimated and infrastructure completely rocked, foreign regime change, all of that, you then have this opening gap for things like this to persist and be strengthened. Um, But I think what's interesting is that no one on the left seemed to care enough about it to at least talk about it or to pretend that they care about it until it was on CNN. So it's almost as if now that mainstream media has spoken about it, you have to now put on a front that you care. You have to pretend that you care. Um, So we have a lot of mostly white, but Western leftists in general, 
who performed a lot of outrage out the, at this only at the sake and only for the reason of condemning the West, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So not mm -hmm. for the sake of because they actually care about these Africans, but because it gives them a chance to say, oh, look at the West looking bad. I agree it makes the West look bad. If that's the narrative you want to go with to care, sure. But at the end of the day, you should care simply because these are Africans being sold as capital, as products, right? Mm -hmm. And we can't divorce what's happening in Libya now from the trans-Saharan slave trade that has been, you know, the trade of Black mm -hmm. Africans by North non-Black Arab North Africans, however we want to kind of construct a dichot somewhat of a dichotomy there. Mm -hmm. um, we can't divorce what we're seeing in Libya now from a history of this anti-Black chattel trade in the exactly. country and across North Africa in the 19th, 18th centuries. Absolutely. Um, and it's, I mean, it's interesting too, even when we think about the many years of um, refugees and people trying to get out of North Africa, trying to get to Europe, drowning in the Mediterranean and the like. Mm -hmm. And we just, it's as if all of that was ignored. Um, and then when we started to see a large exodus coming out of Syria, then the mainstream mm -hmm. news started picking it up more. Um, not to say that there weren't articles written about uh, refugees coming from Africa, but there just wasn't quite the same tenor, panic, um, worry, and certainly not a worldwide outcry um, that we see with regard to Syria. It's really interesting that, as you noted, Devin, it's almost as if we cannot conceive of trauma um, and and just issues in general unless it somehow centers the left, even if even if by accident, right? It's, it's always as if it's like a whisper in the background. This is about the West. It's about the Western intervention. It's about the West doing something. And that's when we focus on it, but not so much when, when there are local crises that perhaps the West may have had something to do with, but it's not the central focus of our discussion of the, the situation. Right. And I think, honestly, that's just a result of this Western chauvinism. Um, and there's always this need to center yourself or to center your empire, even when you think you are making a critique of that empire, mm -hmm. right? So again, back to the trade, the trading of enslaved Africans recently in Libya, even when you're making a grand indictment of the West and their involvement in Libya, right? You're still recentering the West and you're recentering the U.S. in how you speak about the plight and struggles of these Africans. You're not actually censoring their pain, their struggles. Um, and it just, it makes this huge, it just, it shows, it's very obvious. Another example was a few months ago, there was a massive terrorist attack in Somalia that killed hundreds. And instantly people on the left started tweeting and making Facebook statuses about um U.S. drone strikes and U.S. involvement in Somalia that could have led to this extremism, right? And I think that it's interesting that you skipped right over the fact of, you know, sharing how many people died or sharing their pictures mm -hmm. or words from their families or any kind of empathetic and sympathetic um, word at all and went straight to censoring your indictment of the West. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just this real arrogance that comes across in the way that Westerners talk about politics in Africa. Right. Or it's also, I mean, in this case, you would see, for example, um, like, why don't we talk? Of, it, it's almost like a, a kind of performative aspect every time there's a terrorist attack in, in Africa or any other place that's not the U.S., right? Um, there's, mm -hmm. I saw several tweets to the effect of no one's talking about the bombing in Somalia when there were several articles written about it, but it's mm -hmm. as if we i think some some people on the left even though their intentions are good they're trying to um sort of make it about the self or make it about i'm the one person who noticed this even though right. there are articles about it it's just a matter of like you should share one of those articles or you should encourage people to read that right. instead of maybe making yourself the center of being the only one who knows about it. i mean it's just a, a strange phenomenon right. to see over well, and over and i think you can't there are also force dozens of somalis and like my timeline was filled with Somalis. Yeah, like, same. Talking about how worried they were about their families, talking about mm -hmm. praying about Mogadishu, talking about like Al-Shabaab, talking about 
how Somalia and all of these other Muslim majority countries are basically the front lines of the American war on terror and how the people who are killed by this war on terror overwhelmingly are Muslim. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. to say that nobody is talking about it, there were like hella black Africans being okay (laughs) as a Somali, (laughs) as a black Muslim. You know, I'm devastated that this keeps happening to my country. This has been happening Mm -hmm. to my country for a very long time. And then to be like, no one is talking about it. It's like, are you measuring, like, your political moral moral authority, like, from CNN? Like, Mm -hmm. is that the pinnacle of what it means to be in the in the know like how does that work when then you're going to turn around and talk about how cnn is the kind of fourth branch of the u.s government and make your critique about media Mm -hmm. right well and i think that what the western left does almost so naturally that it's unintentionally but it is still intentional is that there are certain struggles and there are certain plights that are quote-unquote sexy or popular to care and talk about for the moment Um, and that's not to say any struggle is more or less important, but they're made more or less important when they're put on this hierarchy. So when you think of like, you know, the free Palestine movement, which I support fully, which has spent decades just getting massive support from the Western left versus, you know, um, let's say a hands-off Congo movement, right? Where in the Congo, you have this starvation of 3 million people that's caused because of the violence perpetuated by multinational corporations, you have this clear lack and clear um, clear difference in education and empathy within the two. Mm-hmm. I think that a good example is the recent events in Niger where the U.S. soldiers were killed. No one cared about, you know, U.S. AFRICOM having so many bases and having so many soldiers on the continent of Africa until something happened to U.S. soldiers, and then it was suddenly popular for 48 hours about it right. where for for several years now i have talked about um president obama's expansion of the u.s africom program they carried out over 600 missions in a two-year span a few years ago on the continent of africa and no one wanted to care or listen or retweet or talk about it at panels and forums until suddenly it's brought to your front door because these u.s soldiers are killed and now it makes you look popular and cool to have kind of a a slap back at the West, right? And it gives you this chance now to care about it for reasons other than just to help Africans. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like a twilight zone of sorts, because again, much like the Libyan slave trade situation, I recall many, many articles coming out uh, during 2015, 2016, about like exposés of sorts about AFRICOM, right? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And so it almost makes you feel like, am I in some sort of time warp? Because now that we're talking about it, why is why aren't so why aren't more people kind of looking back to these those old articles and thinking oh wait we did know about this but we just <laughs> didn't care to talk about it or really put it at the forefront of our concerns because I think we were talking more about the Middle East or right I mean I, I don't know it's really odd um, but it's definitely disorienting if you were would, aware of it you know what's going I on would, now right. <laughs> I would definitely recommend people look into the work of uh, investigative journalist Nick Terse mm-hmm. um, his work in South Sudan is just incredibly resourceful. I mean, he's reported on mass killings and violence and the ways that Washington and the U.S. and the West has funneled arms and weapons into these rebel factions in the region um, between Sudan and South Sudan. It's just it's just phenomenal work. Um, but if you want to look at the neglect, I think South Sudan is just a really obvious example. South Sudan is Mm -hmm. the world's youngest country and was created, um, you know, there's a White House official who in 2006 said that South Sudan was the child of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Literally, you have these quotes of them saying that they ushered in the creation of South Sudan by heightening the tension on both sides of the conflict and kind of exacerbating a small ethnic, you know, tribal dispute. So, I think that the work of Nick Terse is just one example of someone who has been like glaringly trying to tell people, hey, like this is happening here. You should pay attention. You should pay attention. You should pay attention. And now that it's in our faces, people just are pretending like it's brand new. Right. 
It's it's frustrating. Um, but speaking of frustrating, we're coming on about an hour, so I hate to do this. I want to stay talking to you all forever. Um, but I do want to close out, and I'd just like to get your final thoughts. Thinking a bit forward, you know, what can all of us do, no matter where you're from? How can we stay better informed? Um, what can we do to not, I know this sounds like a big question, but how do you decenter the self, right? Um, especially when you're talking about politics elsewhere. And just any final thoughts that you have about what's going on in Zimbabwe, in Southern Africa, um, and how I think Western leftists who really do um, want to be better informed, what can we do to do better, to be honest? Um, and what are some thoughts that you will have about that going forward? Zoe, let's start with you. Um. I think something for me that's been really important in in trying to learn more about conflicts, not just across the continent, but in other parts of the world that I've kind that I've kind of learned from scratch, is to not simply seek out kind of sources that confirm my own assumptions and biases. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that like you know you need to go and see what state media is saying compared to what the people, hashtag the people are saying, but it is to say that, you know, it's the way that, like, white people will have the one black friend who apparently agrees with their racist fuckery um, (laughs) and, like, don't try to make friends with any other people of color because they have their one person who will absolve them of their responsibility for anti-blackness. Like, don't do that when you're sourcing political analyses and history and information about the continent to kind of look for a wide range of information and of sources and to kind of like like average them out and kind of see what makes the most sense based on what you understand, what makes the most sense based on what you're seeing and what makes sense based on analyses that you trust that are not Western and not white. And I would very strongly encourage folks to get, not in contact, but to read more from activists that are on the ground. And you can, and I think that Social media has done a really incredible job of, like, democratizing the ways that people are able to put forth political narratives. And so Twitter has been a really invaluable resource in my, in addition to talking to my family, following along what's happening in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And Devin? Yeah, I mean, my answer is something similar. I think I saw someone on Twitter make a really good point um, in, in saying, why is your first response to to this conflict trying to pick a side rather than just getting all the information. Mm. So I would say, you know, whenever an event happens in a country you might not be very familiar with their politics, search out information for the sake of getting information and knowledge before searching out information for the sake of picking a side. Um, mm. And I think that just speaks for itself. You know, I think we often want to just look for information that confirms our biases and confirms our politics, like Zoe said. But I think that if it's a country I'm personally not familiar with their politics, I first just reach out to people who I trust and who I know who either have knowledge of that country or who are from that country even more, you know, which is even better. And I just try to attain knowledge for the sake of knowing before I make a decision on anything. Um, right. Because, I mean, you know, I've read Marx and Fanon and Lenin and Mao and all these people, and I love to rest on that history, and it's important, but that doesn't mean much if you don't actually know what's happening currently in, in these specific places across the global south. So you can rest on the history that was written by people from other countries, but you need to know the history of that specific country and what context led to what's happening. Well, excellent advice from you both. And thank you so much for being with me here on the Left Pocket Project podcast. It's a lot of peas, uh, but I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for joining me today. Have a good one. And that was episode two of the Left Pocket Project podcast. Thank you again, Zoe and Devin, for joining me. You can follow Zoe on Twitter at ZT Samutsi and Devin at Half Atlanta. Be sure to check out the show notes for more information, including writing on the history of Zimbabwe and additional resources on Southern Africa. Be sure to subscribe to the Left Pocket Project podcast on SoundCloud by going to soundcloud.com slash leftpfc. You can follow the Left Pocket Project on Facebook at facebook.com slash leftpfc 
or on Twitter at Left POC. Finally, please support the Left Pocket Project on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash leftpoc. Thanks for listening. I'm